Thanks for choosing to take flight. And there must have been a short period of time where they were moving through the world, mm. looking at the world in a different way, where they were like, we, we hold something of incredible value, but no one knows yet. I love On a much smaller scale, I felt that way about Jiu-Jitsu, mm. that there was this incredible product out there that was worth its weight in gold, but very few people knew about it. And if they just knew, it could take off. Now, the question was, how would they know? And a series of events lined up to make it work. The first and most important was that the UFC was bought by the Fatita brothers and they made a, a tremendous effort and a highly successful effort to rehabilitate the image of mixed martial arts because like it or not, Jiu-Jitsu's credibility rested on its ability to perform in, this, in the atmosphere of mixed martial arts. So when they took over the UFC, they did an incredible job of rehabilitating the overall image of the, of the UFC. They brought in some rules, uh, they made some changes, and most importantly, they got airtime on TV. They got it back on TV. As mixed martial arts began to rise, Jiu-Jitsu began to rise. The two go together and uh, people most people got introduced to jiu-jitsu through mixed martial arts. Now that's very different from most martial arts. Most martial arts, people get introduced to it through Hollywood. They mm. see it on entertainment and then they go and do the martial art. You know, they see a Bruce Lee movie, they see a Steven Seagal movie, then they go and study the martial art. Jiu-jitsu was very different. It had almost no representation in Hollywood or, or entertainment. Its only real representation was in the real world of mixed martial arts and that's where people came to it from. So as mixed martial arts took off in the early 2000s, so did Jiu-Jitsu. Then on a personal level, I took on as a student an incredibly talented uh, young athlete from Canada called George St. Pierre, who would come down, he was working as a garbage man at the time, and he would come down from Canada on weekends and train. And I remember seeing this young man saying, this guy's gonna change the way mixed martial arts is practiced. Like he's He's got the potential to, to, to create a paradigm shift in the way people see mixed martial arts um, on almost every level. Like first off, he, he had a very clean cut image. He wasn't the wild eyed, tattooed, uh, freak looking fighter who would just show up and pulverize people and, and, um, in a bloodthirsty fashion. He was like a, a gentleman and a scholar. Um, so he, he would have mainstream appeal in a wild world. He looked like a, a gentleman and a scholar in a, in a world full of savages. And uh, physically, he was the amalgam of the various skills that make up martial arts, mixed martial arts to a greater degree than anyone else at, at that time. He was the perfect integration of striking, grappling, uh, and he changed people's attitudes towards martial arts, Previous to him, the whole idea was to specialize in one thing and be adequate at the other areas. Whereas he was never a true specialist in any one discipline in mixed martial arts, but he was very good at all of them. Mm -hmm. And so the key for him wasn't being the best in one area, rather it was the ability to integrate the various areas together better than his opponents. And this changed the way people saw mixed martial arts. And I thought, this young man is going to make a difference. That's and uh, so I started coaching him and, and sure enough, he did exactly that. He, wow. he, uh, he became the first truly mainstream star in the sport. And as his star rose and shone, so too did Judith's. And, and yours? Uh, uh, no, that's not so important. It's more about if, if Judith's rises, then everyone involved in it yeah. rises. That's the most important thing. It's amazing hearing the story firsthand. Like, thank you for sharing that. It's no so problem. If, there's so many things I want to dive into around that. I'm going to pick a couple of things out. Like you said, you mentioned something, use an example of the Wright brothers mm. and how they might have had this gold in their hand for a period of time when they knew something that the world didn't. Likewise with jujitsu. This is similar to people's ideas in life, whether it's a business idea or it could be a podcast or it could be what, something that someone's dreamed of creating for themselves. And they believe it's special but the world hasn't seen it yet or hasn't yeah. bought into it. Like, how do you maintain belief in that? What was your experience with that with jiu-jitsu? Obviously, a lot of it was external. Yeah. But how do you um, want to For me, it was relatively easy because I had 
felt it so many times working as a security guard, as a nightclub bouncer. And so, you know, you will often hear people say the words, Jiu-Jitsu saved my life. Well, in, in my case, it actually did. Like there were three occasions where Jiu-Jitsu did save my life. So I had tremendous faith in it. I had also had uh, many dear friends who I trained with, including uh, my teacher, Henzo Gracie, who achieved remarkable things in the world of professional fighting. And their skill in Jiu-Jitsu was a the, the only thing which made them successful in this regard. And so I had a, a fairly cast iron faith. It was based on just simple observation of both my own situation and those of my close friends, where I had seen people who otherwise were unimpressive in terms of their athleticism or their overall potential for fighting, nonetheless do very well just because they possess this skill. And so I came to see that uh, if someone who like me, had a very unpromising start in Jiu-Jitsu, started very late, started with a crippled body and no background in the sport. If they gained knowledge and skill, they could transform themselves. And I'd seen so many transformations mm. that for me, I had cast iron confidence in its ability. So it was the, the evidence. The only question, yeah, I had the evidence. The only question is, will, will other people see yeah. it the same way? And as mixed martial arts, Rose and Sean, and as stars started to emerge like George St. Pierre, mm -hmm. um, Jiu Jitsu started to rise. Amazing. Interesting because, like, you know, the whole UFC thing, which was a big tipping point, that's external, that's outside of your control. But you were obviously doing things that were working or elevating your status or skill level, talent, call it whatever, because GSP found you as a coach. So, like, how did that come about? Why did he come and train with you? Um, I had uh, established a uh, a solid reputation as a coach in New York City. And um, the jiu-jitsu community is relatively small in the northeast of the United States. There's a much bigger jiu-jitsu community at that time in Southern California. Northeast of the United States, it was New York City was pretty much the only place that where there was a reputable school mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, George lived in Montreal and uh, various people had come down from Canada, trained in New York and they had seen me teach and word of mouth had gone back. So it was essentially, it was word of mouth. Mm. And uh, and then George took a, what was a huge risk for him. That's an eight hour bus ride for, <laughs> a, for a, a garbage man to come down. He spoke no English at the time. His first class he came in, I'll never forget it. I was at the front desk getting ready to teach a beginner's class. And George St. Pierre came in, spoke no English, just looked at me and just, he could, didn't know how to count in English. And he didn't know how much we charged for a class. So he just put all his American money on the table <laughs> and he you know, saved up all his money and he just put all his wow. American money on the table and then looked at me like, like, is this enough? And then I remember putting the money back. I, did, I felt so bad, I just pushed the money back and I said, don't worry, just come in and do the class. And, um, and that's how it started. But yeah, it was a huge risk for him. Wow. Yeah, another example of a leap of faith. Yeah. Hey, it's Mark Whittle. Thanks so much for watching or listening. It's so great to have you a part of the Take Flight movement. Subscribe to the podcast on all platforms, video and audio, to be the first to see new episodes and new conversations with the greatest minds in the world. Follow me at Mark Whittle underscore TF on all social platforms and visit takeflightworld.com to join our growing community of hustlers, performers and go-getters. I can't wait to see you next time. Until then, stay positive, stay motivated, and of course, take flight.